there is lots of cool tech out there. AI, large language models, and various other things coming to general practice in droves. And the question is, are you using them safely? In this episode, I'm going to show you everything you need to consider before you start using these pieces of tech that exist. And I guarantee you there's some of this you haven't done and you're putting yourself and your patients at risk. Let's tech enhance your primary care and learning. Hello, EGP learners. And this episode has been sparked by a colleague of ours. And after reading his article, I felt I just had to create a video that helps general practice and primary care understand its responsibilities when it comes to tech data and various other things, because this is something I see so much of in all the different forums and stuff. And I keep posting about it. And then people are like, what on earth are you talking about? We're going to cover all that for you right now. And effectively what we're talking about is an AI large language model checklist that you need to consider whenever you're using any of these pieces of tech. Now, this is the same, whether you are a partner, whether you're salary GP, locum GP, any other member of the primary care team in general practice. These are things that you need to consider because if you don't, you're actually putting yourself at quite a lot of risk. And when I mean risk, we're talking about data security, governance, and all that kind of stuff and things that actually, if they are found to be wrong, can be really impactful both in patient care, but also financially in terms of fines and penalties, because we are considering whether or not this is stuff that the ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office, may potentially come hunting you for in the future. And you don't want that because those fines are astronomical if you've been found to be negligent. So let's make sure that you're not. Now, big thing about this article, as I said, this has been spurred by one of our colleagues. I'm going to give a massive shout out to Dr. Dave Trisker. If you haven't come across his stuff, highly recommend following him, whichever platform you prefer. I believe he's still on X, Twitter, whatever it's called. Alternately, the best place is definitely LinkedIn. And Dave's an amazing GP. He's been on the channel a few times and we've covered some of his stuff. There's loads of stuff he's done in terms of AI and support and things. And up there with people like Dr. Keith Grimes, who I have mentioned and showcased on the channel a few times as well. But recently, he created an article that I think just summarizes everything you need to know. So let's take a quick look, shall we? So this is the article. And if you want to have a look at it, I will put the links to this down below in the show notes. And I'll show you how to get to there in a second and stuff. But basically, this article talks about a gold standard checklist for the healthcare professionals using AI and large language models. And this has particularly become more relevant because of the proliferation of AI tools that exist in general practice. In this episode, what we're going to talk about is the key things that you need to consider. So in particular, the eight questions that you need to ask everybody when they're coming to you with all these different pieces of kit. And then also the documentation that you need to see in order to make sure that this is safe and appropriate for you to use. And that's particularly the case for GP partners, because unfortunately, that's where the buck will stop with a lot of this. So should we take a quick look at this? So th he talks about some of the key things to ask. And the first thing he says in terms of this documentation checklist that you need to look at is the GDPR compliance. So important to remember that in the UK, we do still follow GDPR. And as a result of that, the guidance of how that data is stored and used must comply with GDPR principles. Particularly the big one is the storage of the data and servers. And in particular, is that based in the UK? Because if it's not, it's not GDPR compliance and things. Next up, we talk about anonymization of the data. So what processes do they use in terms of anonymizing that particular data to make sure that it is safe and you know transferable? There are things like encrypted aspects and stuff, but actually some companies will use pseudo anonymized data so they can still track it back based off other resources versus completely anonymized and data and stuff and that can actually not be tracked and therefore as a result of that is completely safe and in particular it's really hard to anonymize data when you're using large language models in order to do that and things you then need to think about the security and we'll come on to some of the certificates and documentation that you need to consider in some of that but what measures are in place by the company themselves to make sure that data is safe and secure is it hackable how hackable etc and things and then again what data do they actually collect now important to remember Remember that if any of these platforms are storing data in any way, shape or form, that significantly increases the risk and also the way that that data needs to be safeguarded and processed and stuff. But then again, what level of data and particularly again with AI, large language models, 
they often collect a lot of data that you're not aware of because maybe they need that appropriately, but maybe that's extra data for them to be used and monetized in a different way. And that's one of the big concerns also people have with things like Amazon, Google, Facebook, et cetera. And that's why standard LLMs and AI are not usable for patient identifiable data in general practice and things because of the fact that they just store so much other stuff as well. We then need to talk about the clinical safety standards. So these are the specific certificates I'm going to come to in the later section and explain in a little bit more detail for you. But again, is this considered a medical device? That's a really fine line to cross for some people. And that's one of the reasons why, for example, Q risks only went out of use in general practice because that was considered a medical device and the certification process for that was so significant that a lot of the providers just felt it's easier not to have that included. But how does that apply for AI and large language models? And then finally, coming up to things like data breaches and stuff, how does the company handle data breaches and stuff in terms of errors? And then lastly, actually, how can they explain this to you in terms of how the AI model is actually used? Because there's this question about what is real AI, and a lot of people don't really understand the difference between machine learning based AI versus actual generative AI and how does that work and things. So these are the eight questions you should be asking of any provider when you are starting to use their products in general practice. And if they can't give you clear and cogent answers on this, then you absolutely need to be checking this next stuff, which is the documentation. Okay, so what is the documentation? Well, there are several parts to this, and we're going to cover them right now for you. So first up, we've got something called the DPIA, so the Data Protection Impact Assessment. Now, this is something that you need to have done. And when I mean you, this is often going to be the practice or the PCN or the organization that you're working with needs to have done something called a data protection impact assessment. And this ideally should be done whenever there's a significant change. So either you're taking on a new product or you've had a significant change in the way that data flows in your practice. Classic point for many practices right now is when you transition from, for example, a triage based system to a digital triage based system or another appointment system to total triage, for example, those kind of tools that you're using, you need to have done a DPIA. And really important to remember that this is something that you, yes, you in the practice need to have done. This is not something that an organization will do for you. You need to assess this and it is your assessment of this that will be key. Really important to remember that organizations like CQC, the ICO and stuff, they may ask to see your DPIAs for the various different processes and things that you have done. And if you cannot provide them, get ready for a more detailed inspection and stuff. So this is something that you do need to do now. Absolutely, these providers can help you fill in these forms. They're not massively onerous, but they are not a small piece of work either because you do need to consider how the information flows and who's responsible, how that's going to be managed, how that's going to be stored, processed, et cetera, and all that kind of stuff. So really important one, do not skimp on doing this because otherwise the, the impact of this will be so significant for you in practice. Next up, we've got things called the DPA. So what is this? This is the data processing agreement. Now, this is often what's given to you by the provider themselves. They will give you this information in terms of what the agreement is. And this is the agreement between yourself and the provider in terms of how that data will be handled. So all that stuff we talked about earlier, a lot of that should be included in the data processing agreement and stuff. So have a side to that, have a copy of it, analyze it you know, check it and things. We talked about security, as you can imagine, things like the cyber essential plus certificate, which is the level that these companies need to be achieving to, that should be provided to. So you've got, again, on hand, if you're ever asked to provide it to other organizations and stuff like CQC, like the ICO, if you ever have a data breach and things, that's the information that you do need to have. And what's absolutely useful to have is also further information on this. So things like um, penetration testing. So what does this mean? How hackable are their software and stuff? We've seen this with, unfortunately, recently we've had a few data breaches and things that have occurred nationally and hacks and all that kind of stuff. So data, pre uh, so penetration testing is basically companies paying someone to try and break their system and what level of penetration have they got and things. And you do need to that to be a certified level. Um, Dave has mentioned in this article about things like Crest. Actually, I don't know what Crest is, but definitely worth having a look at and stuff and things. 
Then we come on to the clinical safety certificates. Now, there are two commonly used in general practice. The one that's relevant for yourself, if you're looking at using these providers, is the DCB0129. So this is the individual u- cl- clinical user one, which basically is often the practice level. There's an alternative one called the DCB0160. This is more for organizations. So this tends to be things like ICBs, PCNs, much larger organizations that are buying and using these particular pro- um, providers and stuff. But as a practice, you need to be looking at the DCB. 0129. This is also the one that may also be involved in things like medical certification and stuff and things like that. We talked about GDPR. They need to provide you with a compliance certificate to show that they are compliant with GDPR and what level and stuff and things. And absolutely, you should be asking to be seeing that. And then finally, we've got things like audit reports and stuff. Now, why would they provide that? Well, as we know, Audits are everywhere in general practice, but actually, are they checking the data? There's no good having done the certification and saying, that's it, we never need to do it again. They need to be checking, checking, checking. That's where the audit reports come into play. Do you need to understand all that? Yes, a little bit, to be honest. And I think it's really important that people do understand the impact that this has. So what I am going to talk about is something called responsibility. And the reason why I'm talking about this is what I've seen in many fora and stuff is people trying various pieces of tech and not having considered a lot of this stuff and how that will impact you and how that will impact the work that you're doing, how that will change what you're currently being able to do. And when you start using patient identifiable information with this, the risk level jumps up so much significantly that actually if you haven't considered these, you are potentially caught liable. And I'm afraid a big shout out to the partners out there Unfortunately, the likelihood is if your staff are using these products without telling you, then it is likely the organizations will come for yourselves rather than as members of staff. Now, there is joint liability, in my view here, that comes across. So, for example, if you have a locum or salary doctor who decides to use one of these products without telling you, without checking, and without looking at the say, data security stuff with yourself, my view, they are absolutely jointly culpable in terms of that. But I think you should also have an organizational policy that talks to people about the level of tech and stuff that they need to and should be using in their practices and stuff, as well as partners just trying these kind of tech things and stuff. You just need to also do that sensible check at that point to make sure that you've understood that in more detail and also the implications of that. And like I said, having all those certificates ready, because if you get CQC inspection, they ask for this. It is on you to provide it and stuff. So where can you get more help with this? Well, absolutely, the providers themselves can give you a lot of support and stuff with this in order to help you understand what you need to do and what you need to think about and stuff. If you want more detail about those various different things that I've just shown you, then absolutely check out this episode that I did with Dustin Saint from Primary Care IT. And we talked about these digital certificates in so much more detail and how you go about looking at them and stuff. It's not too long. It's about half an hour or so. It's got links down below that you can have a look at, but also it's got the chapters for the various different sections. So what is a DPIA? What is a DCB? The the various different forms and stuff. DTACs are the ones that you need to maybe consider if you're doing this on a larger scale and stuff. So these are the things you need to think about and look at and if you want to do that for this episode as well then feel free to do so you can absolutely check out the chapters down below go back and have a look at this stuff alternately make sure you subscribe and like this video as well share it with your colleagues particularly your partners particularly your colleagues in general practice and stuff who haven't thought about this stuff because they need to they need to be aware of it and they need to be considering the impact that this will have in general practice if you want to read Dave Trisker's article, that link will definitely be down below in the show notes. And you can check out that episode on the certificates that's coming up right here. Also, there's always going to be more stuff coming up for you on eGP Learning. Make sure you subscribe and I will catch you in the next episode.